I have a disclaimer for you here this morning. I've never given this disclaimer before, but I just want everybody to acknowledge that I didn't pick out this passage of scripture to point fingers at anybody. It's just the next passage that we're teaching in the series as we go through the book of Luke, right? And so, you know, any names, events, presentations, it's all fictional. I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm not thinking of any particular situation, just so we get that out of the way. Okay, now we can move on with that. Uh, I've entitled the message today, Glacier Glasses, Luke chapter 17, verse 1 through 4. We've been out of the book of Luke now for, geez, I think about a month and a half now because of Easter and Palm Sunday and me going out of town and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's been, uh, it's been quite a while, but we're going to jump back into the book of Luke now and uh, go back through there and, and just get into the life and ministry of Jesus as he makes his way up to Jerusalem now for the last time. Uh, many scholars say he's got about six months, three to six months left in his ministry, in his life. Uh, and, and he's making his way to Jerusalem uh, where he knows he's going to die. He knows that uh, he's going to be killed and brutally killed and, uh, and then resurrect and then ascend into heaven and then pass this ministry on that he has started to his disciples, to me, to you. And so what we've seen really since like chapter 9 all the way through 19 It goes on this uh, journey as Jesus has set his face like a flint, it says, to go up to Jerusalem, knowing what's going to happen, but saying, this is my father's will. I'm going to do my father's will. And it's just an amazing thing as we follow along with him. In chapter 14, many, many months ago now, uh, there began there uh, a series of Jesus having interactions with the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus having interactions with the crowd, the multitudes, who, the looky-loos, the hey, feed us some free food, uh, and then also interactions with his, again, disciples, because they need to know what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing wrong. They need to know that, that uh, they don't have the, father, the Father's heart for the people. They're not forgiving the people. They're not leading people into the kingdom of God They're really blind guides, Jesus has said, and you're going to lead people into the ditch. And really that is at the crux of what we're going to study here today. Uh, The very last thing that we studied, I don't know if you remember it or not, it's been quite a few uh, weeks now, but the very last thing that we read was the parable that Jesus told about a rich man and a poor beggar man, Lazarus, who went down who died and and went down into Sheol. The one rich man went over to the the part where the unrighteous dead go to, where they're in torment, what we would call hell. The righteous dead go to Abraham's bosom. And so he told that story. And really he was again pointing back to the Pharisees. This is your end If you continue down the path that you're going down, if you continue down this self-righteous road that you're headed down, and in the midst of that, also dragging people with you, you're going to end up in that same place where that rich man ended up. Because Jesus identified them right before that as being those who love the riches. They love the attention of the crowd. They love the riches, and that's what they were in it for. They weren't in it for caring for the needs of the people taking care of the sheep that God had brought to them to care for their needs. It's why Jesus was so angry when he walked into Jerusalem the first time and saw all the selling of animals and the the converting of money from the Roman money into the uh, uh, temple money. It's because Jesus realized they were ripping off the people. God's people were coming to confess their sins, to offer their offerings to the Lord as they'd been told to do. And they'd show up with a lamb and the priest would say, oh, that lamb has got spots all over it. You need to get one of our lambs. So go over there and buy one of the spotless lambs. And so they'd have to take this poor lamb that they've raised 
uh, at great expense to themselves, and they'd have to take it and uh, go over and, and maybe trade it with somebody and get some more money and then buy an expensive lamb that has been pre-approved by the priests. And then they bring it back over, and then they try to give them the money for it, and they say, oh, you can't give us Roman money. You've got to go over here and get your money exchanged at our special exchange rate. And, uh, and therefore, uh, they were ripping them off there as well. And that's why Jesus was so angry. And that's why he started turning over tables and he made a whip and he started beating them because he realized that the people who were supposed to be caring for the sheep were fleecing the sheep and treating them very poorly. And I just lost my, micro, or my uh, mouse here. But that is the situation we're looking at. It's the last thing that Jesus said is this parable about a rich man in hell, in torment. And so now as he begins the 17th, 17th chapter, he begins with that same idea. There's no break. This is one long continuous day in the life of Jesus Christ. And so then after he says that to those Pharisees and those scribes, then he turns to his disciples. And now he begins to give them an application so that they know how to treat the people, how to treat uh, God's people in God's eyes and in his way. And so there you see in verse 1 of chapter 17, um, he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Then he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Amen? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word once again, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us wisdom in understanding it, in interpreting it, and applying it in our own lives today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've given you the disclaimer. So none of that is about any of you in particular. But hey, if the Holy Spirit hits you with a rock, you are welcome to yelp out because you've been hit by the rock, okay? But um, Glacier Glasses, why do I call it that? Well, back in the 1980s, Glacier Glasses were all the rave where I lived over in Grand Junction. I don't know if they were the rave where you were back in the early 80s. My wife says, no, they're horrible. She hates them. But, uh, you know, people love these glasses back then in that day. And uh, you can see why if you were rock climbing or out in uh, a snowy area, they shield the sides of your eyes so you don't get that glare from the snow and, and uh, there's no distractions on the side. And they're very dark and reflective and all that. Well, my brother, Gary, loved those glasses, let me tell you. He thought those were the coolest things and he wore his glacier glasses everywhere. This is my high school graduation, by the way. He was there in his, in his glacier glasses. And um, he loved those glasses. And I used to tease him about those glasses because I didn't think they were all that cool. But um, that's what little brothers do. They tease their older brothers, right? And so, so anyway, you guys know that Geraldine and I and Jeremiah went down to Georgia not the devil, me and my wife and my kids. We went down to Georgia uh, last weekend and saw my brother. That's where he lives now. And uh, spent time with him. And I thought it would be cool if I bought a pair of those glasses for the two of us to wear while I was down there. And so there we were sporting our glacier glasses the whole time we were in Georgia. And then one day we're sitting at lunch and our wives start making fun of us because of how stupid these glacier glasses look on us. And then my nephew and my son, they start in as well, making fun of us. Dad, those are ugly. You should take those off. But my brother and I, we stood firm. We said, no, we love these glacier glasses and we're going to keep them. And we kept them on and, and much to their chagrin. Now, I was very adamant about it. No, I'm keeping them. I don't care what you say. I said to my son, I don't care what you think about my glasses. I'm wearing them anyway. 
And, you know, it, it really reminded me of how arrogant we can become sometimes within the church, within the body of Christ. You know, we only see through these narrow lenses sometimes. We only care about our own things. We don't care about how others feel sometimes. We have these blinders on, on the sides, and uh, we're really just tunnel vision down the middle of the road. And uh, oftentimes we don't see the hurts and the, the needs of others. Oftentimes we don't uh, sense that they're upset with us and, and therefore we don't ask for their forgiveness. We don't repent of that. We don't apologize. And as a result, people's feelings get hurt. People get, as Jesus said, offended with us. Now, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Have you ever been offended at church? Has somebody ever offended? Let's do it this way. Have you never been offended at church? Has nobody ever hurt your feelings? Raise your hand. I mean, obviously, right? We get offended by people. We get our feelings hurt. We, uh, we get beat up. And a lot of times people walk away from the church and they just say, I don't have anything to do with the church. I've been hurt too many times. Yeah, I've been there. You know, and uh, so what do we do? Well, Jesus gives us some very clear understandings here today. Hey, don't sin against your brother. Don't stumble your brother. If you really love each other, you won't deliberately do something or say something to your brother or your sister to stumble them and offend them. And if you do, then go say you're sorry. Go make it right with that brother and that sister. Don't deliberately try to offend anybody. And I think it's a a beautiful way for us to uh, just acknowledge where we're at in the church today. There's so many... Uh, church growth kind of programs out there, right, to try to grow the church in a very carnal way, where, you know, how can we do this? What, what can we do to get more people to come? We'll water down the message a little bit. We'll only talk for 20 minutes instead of 50 minutes, you know, all those kind of things, to try to drag more people in the door so we can have more numbers, right? But I think the greatest church growth program there is, not that I really know, obviously, we're not a great big church, but, you know, Hey, forgive each other. Let's try that for church growth, right? Don't offend each other deliberately. And when you do, ask for forgiveness. And uh, repent of your sins. Repent of how you've hurt somebody. Somebody comes to you and rebukes you, then recognize that hurt and, and just ask for forgiveness. Of course, what Jesus is talking about is on a whole other level where you have the spiritual rulers of an entire nation, God's nation, where he has set up this nation to really minister not only to the nation of Israel and to the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel, but to really take that message to the whole world through the Messiah. And they're failing miserably at doing that. And uh, you see Jesus' reaction as he is the great shepherd. He sees God's sheep being treated poorly, being led astray, being led into the ditch, being led into hell. And he's furious about it. It would be better for you if that's what you're going to do. It would be better for you if you're going to deliberately lead God's people astray and lead them into hell. It would be better for you to have a millstone around your neck and you'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. He says in another place, it'd be better if you were never born. If that's the track you're going to take. And that's the message to the Pharisees and the scribes. If you're going to offend these little sheep that God has given you to care for, then woe to you. But then he says to us as the disciples, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. Don't say anything. Don't do anything that's going to make some poor little sheep of God's flock decide, yeah, I'm not going to church anymore. Heck with that stuff. I'm walking away from Christianity altogether. I'll just do my own thing. I'll go worship out in the forest or something. And people do that. The complete uh, picture of what Jesus says here in Matthew uh, 18, he says, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so when he talks about children, it's not just saying, well, we should treat the children in this special way. 
he's saying, he's using children as an analogy to say everyone. We're all children in God's eyes, right? I mean, none of us are grown-up adults in God's eyes. We're his children. We're his little children. And uh, many of us very, very immature and, and weak in our faith and not able to take a whole lot of beating and not able to take a whole lot of being led astray before uh, we're just driven away completely. And so uh, he talks about this idea of children in this way to, to give us this understanding. He called that little child. He sent him on his lap. He said, okay, if you want to be a child of God, here's a good example for you right here, this little child. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And so again, you see Jesus is not pulling any punches here, is he? I mean, that's a pretty severe punishment right there to say that. And I'm sure most of you know what a millstone looks like, you know, these massive stones that they used to grind up grain with uh, before we had the natural processing uh, methods or the mechanical processing methods that we have now. But uh, very heavy, 400 to 700 pounds, you know, some of them 3,000 pounds, massive stones. And so that's not the greatest kind of necklace you could have. <laughs> it's not what you'd want to wear. I mean, it's just instant. Phew, you're going down. You're going to sleep with the fishes, right? And uh, I, mean, I, heard a, a guy, I heard a pastor from, I think, New Jersey or something teaching on this message, and he was going into that. You're going to be sleeping with the fishes. But anyway, um, that's the severity of what Jesus is trying to bring across, though how he cares for his people, how he cares for his flock, how the father feels about forgiveness of his children and caring for the needs of his children. You know, the Pharisees and the scribes, they had a rule. They said, hey, if somebody asks for forgiveness three times, forgive them. After that, pff, get rid of them. Be done with them. Don't even look at them. You don't have, ever have to have anything to do with that person ever again. Jesus comes along. He says, seven times, 70 times 7, however many times. Why does he say that? Because that's what he does for us, right? How many times has God forgiven you? How many times has God had mercy and grace upon you when you sin? How many times has he said, yes, I forgive you. Yes, I forgive you. Yes, I forgive you. Over and over and over and over again. Over the course of your lifetime, you could probably think of thousands upon thousands of sins that you've asked the Lord to forgive you of, and he's absolutely said yes. And that's the heart of the Father right there. And that's not the heart of the Pharisees. And that's what Jesus is trying to bring across here. And so he says, uh, if, your eye, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and, be ca and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter the, into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast into everlasting fire. Again, he's talking about the severity of not being on the right path, the severity of believing that you're righteous, but really you're walking down a path of unrighteousness. And so what do you do about that? You get real with it. You get real with it. You chop off that hand. You chop off, chop, pluck out that eye if you need to, because even the severity of whatever it takes is better than going to hell for eternity, right? If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And so again, Jesus is giving some very stark, very uh, powerful uh, images about not following after the ways of the Pharisees and the scribes, but really following after his father's heart and the will of, the will of his father. Um, again, you see that uh, parable that Jesus talked about uh, with the, the, why, uh, the poor man and the rich man going into Sheol. He says there, uh, so that the beggar died and was carried to the, by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. He was buried and being in torments in hell, he lifted his eyes. Oh, you know, Abraham, he sees Abraham over there. He sees that poor beggar over there. 
and he just starts to cry out, please, just give me a, a drop of water uh, to, to take away this pain and suffering. Then he cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in, in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The stakes can't get any higher. <laughs> you know, the stakes cannot get any higher. We don't want to end up here. Nobody wants to end up here. We don't want to drive somebody to end up there because there is no relief. There is no relief. There's, there's pain. There's torment for all of eternity. And we don't like to think about that. We hate that idea. But that's the image that Jesus is wanting to convey here about what these scribes and Pharisees are doing and what we can do as we become scribes and Pharisees as Christians. And so we have to be very careful about that in our own lives. Um, you see there at the end of that passage, Jesus says, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And so he uses a lot of different words to convey just a child of God, uh, a little sheep, a little one, a little child, uh, just someone that God loves and wants to see come into his kingdom. He, he wants all of them. He wants all of us to come to a place of repentance and enter into that kingdom. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to that horrible place. Um, and so we, as we go back and look at this idea of these glacier glasses that sometimes we can put on, only concerned about our own issues, uh, you know, getting that tunnel vision and not being concerned about others that we may be hurting or offending, we're going to look at it in these two uh, contexts. No offense is given and no offense is taken. And so looking at that again, you can follow along in your Bible if you want, but I've got it up here on the screen if you can see that. Uh, then he said to, again, his disciples, the disciples, those who are following after Jesus, those who say, man, this guy's got the words of eternal life. Where else am I going to go? I'm going to follow him to the grave. I'm going to, you know... Uh, Jesus said, hey, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. And, uh, and that requires some sacrifice. And, and these are the people that Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the true disciples, the followers, who are going to take on this ministry and carry it on after he goes into glory. So he says to those disciples, and he says to you and to me here today, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It is impossible that we're not going to offend each other. Now, that's pretty freeing for me. <laughs> Geraldine and I were talking about it yesterday. That should be a very freeing thing for us as Christians, to recognize that I'm going to offend people, and they're going to, what? Offend me. We're going to offend each other. It's just who we are. We're human beings. We have no ability to be perfect. We have no ability to walk through this life, to interact with each other here at church, to interact with other people out at work and in other places, in our families. We have no ability to be perfect in those relationships. We are going to say something. We are going to have our glacier glasses on someday, and we're not going to see the needs of somebody, only our own needs, and we're going to hurt them. We're going to hurt their feelings and, and maybe offend them in some way that they get really upset with us. And so what do we do about that? Well, Jesus tells us, just ask for forgiveness. A kind word turns away wrath, right, is what the Bible says. But so often we're unwilling to do that because we have these glacier glasses on. We have blinders on. It's impossible that no offenses should come. We just need to drill that into our heads. I was listening to a pastor earlier this week, and he said, you know, that's one of the most overlooked passages in the entire scripture right there, is that we're just going to offend each other. We're bound to do it. And so why do you get so upset when somebody offends you? It's easy to do, isn't it? What? What? You said what to me? I mean, we get so mad at people. We get so mad at each other when we get offended. But shouldn't we just take off those glasses for a minute and go, oh, that's right, you're human. I was looking through these, these glasses here and thought you were perfect and you weren't going to offend me and I wasn't going to offend you. But you take those glasses off, you realize we're human. We're going to do it. We're going to offend each other. 
And so just get used to that idea and don't be so offended when somebody says something to you that you don't like. And so woe to those whom they do come. Now, of course, again, he's talking directly uh, to his disciples here, but the Pharisees are listening. They're in the crowd. And, and that's the woe that's being discussed. I don't think, uh, you know, because, uh, of course, in the, in the church, uh, you know, we talk about the fact that once we are saved, we're saved from the foundation of the earth. You know, I don't believe that you can lose your salvation, but were you truly saved in the first place is, is always the question. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think the passage is trying to teach you know, woe to you, you're going to lose your salvation if you treat somebody badly and they get offended. Uh, I I think, again, he is pointing back to the fact that the Pharisees are leading people astray deliberately and leading them into hell. And and that is why the severe uh, condemnation comes down upon their heads. It would be better for him if a millstone, again, were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, just think about that for just a second. Just think about having a millstone hung around your neck and being thrown into the sea. I mean, that's so graphic. It's just, it's like a a horror movie or something to think about doing that to somebody. But again, Jesus wants you to be gripped by that. He wants you to be moved by that image. And uh, I I think a lot of times Jesus says stuff like that. Oh, that's just (laughs) flowery talk from Jesus. You know, he, he is serious. He is dead serious. It would be better for you if you were never born than to drive somebody away from their heavenly father. And, uh, and so he's being very severe here indeed. Jesus' reference to, this is John Corson, I believe. Jesus' reference to a millstone hung around the neck of anyone who attempted to undermine the childlike faith of his children was in response to the Pharisees who had derided him in the previous chapter. If this doesn't sound like gentle Jesus, meek and mild, it's because Jesus is also the good shepherd who will fight ferociously and protect his lambs from wolves who would come in and seek to destroy their faith. And I think that is right on. That's what he's dealing with here. There are wolves out there who would seek to lead people astray and lead them down the wrong path into hell. And Jesus is saying, woe to those persons. Woe to those people. Woe to you, Christian, if you take on some kind of false doctrine, if you wander away from God's word and then start leading others down a path in which they might never come to faith in Jesus Christ. Woe to you. It's interesting how we can offend people. There's a true story, actually, about a a little girl who was at a secular school, and uh, it was an art class, where the teacher got up and said, okay, I want uh, you, you three to come up here on the chalkboard and draw something uh, that is important to you. What is important to you? Go ahead and come up on to the chalkboard and draw what's important to you. And this little girl coming from a Christian home, she went up and she drew a cross, a big cross right there on the chalkboard. And of course the teacher, you know, oh, we can't do that here. You know, that's a, that's a religious symbol and we can't talk about that here. And you can't, you know, go erase that. And he didn't want anybody to, to uh, see it and just took it off the board and really offended this little girl. She started crying and she went home and she told her mommy and daddy, you know, why did he do this? Why can't I draw a cross on the board and, and all this kind of stuff? And uh, I don't know if that's me or not. But um, so... The parents, of course, got very upset about that and went to the principal and told them what had happened and and really, you know, threatened to uh, expose the school for doing this. And the principal apologized and he said, it's fine, we're not going to do that, we're not going to expect our teachers to do that and we're sorry and, you know, it was all fine. And so when the girl came back, the teacher did it again. He said, okay, well, let's go ahead and try this again. You know, everybody come up and draw something that's important to you. And the little girl went up on the board and she drew a cross, but she drew it very small this time. She drew it very small because her faith had been wounded. Her heart had been wounded. She had been offended. Somebody trampled upon her. And rather than draw that big cross on the board, she just drew a little one. 
And I think it's a good example of what happens to us within the church as, as we get offended, as we get stomped on, as we have our feelings hurt, as our faith is challenged. And sometimes it just is, and, we, and we help, uh, it helps us to grow. But oftentimes it, it does wound us in a way that we don't talk about our faith anymore. We don't uh, really make the effort to um, share our faith because we've been wounded before. And so we need to be very careful of wounding those dear little sheep. Uh, Matthew 18 goes on there, that same passage we're dealing with. He says, uh, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If he refuses to, uh, and then he goes on actually, uh, the next verse 16 or, uh, yeah, 16 says, um, and then go get somebody else and take them with you. And if he still doesn't hear you, then go and tell it to the church. And then it says, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church, sorry. Uh, but if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And so there is this really a, a requirement of the believer in order to maintain a good, healthy church that doesn't carry on offending people, we are really uh, exhorted, almost commanded to make it right. Make it right with that brother and sister. Don't let this thing drag on. Don't let this thing fester. Go to that brother and sister, the one you know you offended. You know when you've offended somebody. You know when they're mad at you, <laughs> not wanting to talk to you. You know it. Just go to them and say, you know what? I don't know what I did, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Or if you know what you did, just say it. Please forgive me. Uh, but then the other idea is that if you have done the same, don't wait for them to come to you. You go to them first and say, you know what? I know I hurt your feelings. Please forgive me. And, and try to make it right. Try to make it right with them. Don't let it fester. Don't let it be blown into some big deal. And uh, I think it's a great exhortation for us here. And so no offense is taken. Don't get so offended. A mature believer, I think, comes to a place where you just recognize that people are people. I always say it, right? Dogs bark. Cats meow. Cows moo. Sinners do what? They sin, <laughs> and they, part of sin is offending each other. You're going to offend people, and so don't get so offended that you break fellowship with other believers. And so Jesus now directly says, all right, you disciples, all right, you followers of Jesus Christ, all right, you who say you've taken up his cross and, and you've denied yourself and crucified your flesh, now... Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. We don't like to do a lot of rebuking these days, do we? It's hard. It's hard to walk up to somebody and say, you know what? You really hurt my feelings and you need to say you're sorry, right? And rebuke somebody in that way. I mean, it's just not something we're comfortable doing. But you know what? When we don't do it, we destroy the church of God. And people get upset and they say, that's it, I'm leaving that church. There's another church over there. I've heard they don't offend each other over there. So I'm going to go over there. The grass is much greener on that, that side of the fence. And I'm going over there. And then you go over there and you get offended. <gasps> what? Isn't it better if we all just forgive each other? If we just do a little rebuking when it's needed? Deal with the issue, even though it's a confrontation and none of us like to confront each other. But in the end, isn't it beautiful when we can just hug each other and say, man, let's just, let's just go on with the Lord. Let's just move on and, and just serve the Lord again together without this thing between us. It's a beautiful thing, really. And it's Jesus here commanding us to do it. If your brother sins, rebuke them. Now, you can rebuke in a kind way. You don't have to be a jerk about it. But to just let it fester, just, oh, yeah, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Oh. I hate that person. You know, 
I mean, that's what we do as Christians sometimes. We get these nasty little things going on between us, and before we know it, uh, the church just breaks down and, uh, and doesn't continue on serving the Lord in the right way. And so if he repents, forgive him. Let it go. Jesus just gave in, in the Matthew 18 part of it. If he doesn't repent, okay, well, I'm going to go get another brother over here, and I'm going to bring him along, and we're going to rebuke you together. <laughs> you know, the two of us. And it doesn't have to be somebody that saw the situation and agrees, and, and definitely you don't want to go around, you know, well, oh, this person really upset me, and, you know, backbiting and that kind of stuff. You want to just take somebody and say, hey, this is what the Bible says that I should do. You've hurt my feelings. I'm offended. You did something wrong. I ask you to repent, and you refuse to. Now I'm bringing another brother, another sister along to verify that God's word is established. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established is what the Bible says. And so uh, that's why you're bringing that other person to say, hey, this is what the Bible tells us to do. Not to pile on people and, and to try to uh, get some kind of uh, lynch mob going, but uh, just to make it right so we can move on, move on with our church and our relationships. So if he repents, forgive him. Again, Matthew eighteen fifteen. 15, uh, uh, I think we already covered that. Yeah, we did that one already, so that's an extra. Sorry. <laughs> but if he sins, that's a bonus track. If he sins against you seven times in a day, oh man, come on, Jesus, seven times in one day. Have you, ever, have you ever had anybody sin against you seven times in one day? I mean, most of us, I think, would say, no, never. I mean, after the third time, I'd never talk to that person again, you know, most of us say. Um, so it's already this crazy idea of seven times in one day. And, and that's when Peter comes back to him later and says, now, Jesus, let me, let me clarify what you said there. Up to seven times in one day? And, uh, you know, but before we go to that verse that's coming up next, it, it, seven times in one day returns to you and says, I repent. You shall, you shall forgive him. You shall forgive him. You shall let it go and, and just say, all right, praise the Lord. We're, we're back together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, Evidently, I deleted that one. But anyway, uh, the verse that, that Jesus was talking about in that situation where he, um, let me see if I can go back to that. Uh, Peter says to Jesus, you know, did you say up to seven times in one day? And Jesus says, no, if he sins against you 70 times seven, 490 or however many that is, you know, forgive him. I'm not saying there's a limit. There's not a, uh, you know, a certain uh, formula for this. And we like to formulize things in the, in the church, don't we? Sure. Is, it, is this thing just bumping against me? Check your connection on the box to make sure it's Because it's kind of annoying, isn't it? I'm annoyed too, just so you know. Please forgive me. Please forgive me for that. All right, so anyway, he's saying, no, it's not, um, I'm just all over the place here. It's not a formula. Yeah. It's not a certain amount of times, and you're waiting for that seventh time. Okay, good, that's it, seven times, you're out of here, you're not my friend anymore. I don't ever have to talk to you again. Again, how many times has God forgiven you? How many times? Can you think more than 490? <laughs> Probably so thousands of times that we've come to God and have to ask once again Lord forgive my sins wash me, cleanse me make it right again please forgive me so again uh, church growth I think that's the best, best church growth plan there is for the church to grow in maturity together to be a church that forgives each other to be a church that, that doesn't uh, continually have this chafing against one another and offending of one another. We must be mature in our faith to forgive each other, to rebuke each other, and, uh, and to repent and humble ourselves as that little child 
uh, to come to that place of, of recognizing we've done wrong to our brother or sister. Church growth strategies are a death gurgle of a church that has lost its way. Somebody has said, I think that's a great quote. Um, Again, you know, let's try to grow the church with carnal methods rather than just do what Jesus told us to do. If we just do what Jesus told us to do, he will add the increase. He will bring the people. But if we continually backbite and hurt each other and and offend each other and don't ask for forgiveness, uh, we will come to an equilibrium and people will break off and they'll leave. And uh, we just don't want to see that happen in our church dare I say again? (laughs) It happens. It just happens. People get upset and they leave um, for a lot of different reasons. Just closing with this verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 8. Paul, uh, in dealing with a lot of issues, he, he comes to this place of talking about not making our brothers stumble. And in their culture, you know, they had meat markets, and in the meat markets, those uh, animals had been sacrificed to idols. And so the Christians asked, are we allowed to eat that kind of meat? We don't want to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol, do we? And so Paul's dealing with that, and he's basically saying, you know, if you're not offended by it, I mean, what is an idol? An idol is nothing. It's just meat, (laughs) you know, just... Don't get offended by it. If you can handle it, eat it yourself. But if your brother or your sister in Christ, if they're stumbled by watching you eat meat that you know has been offered to an idol, then for your brother's sake, don't eat that meat. Don't do those things. And there's so many applications for that in our Christian walks today. Drinking alcohol and smoking and, you know, listening to certain kind of music, going to certain movies, all that kind of stuff, you know, what you could stumble your brother in doing. If you can do those things and and you feel a liberty to do those things and you feel like God's given you some kind of liberty to do something, then that's between you and the Lord. But if you know that your brothers are stumbled by it, your sisters would be stumbled by it, don't do it uh, in an effort to not stumble them. That's why he says here, when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. And so it's a a great verse for what we're talking about here today. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. I mean, Paul took off those glasses. He took off those glacier glasses. He said, look, if I stumble my brothers and sisters in Christ in doing something, I'll never do that again. Not because it it doesn't bring, bring me pleasure or I'm okay with it or whatever, It doesn't matter if you're okay with it. Are you going to hurt somebody else? And that is the question that that Jesus is dealing with here. And so uh, we have to keep these things in mind. Again, take off those glasses. Take off those blinders that keep you on that narrow path of just seeing your own needs and your own desires. And think about the people that are around you. Not only in the church, but of course in your family and and in other relationships that you have. Take off those glasses. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word here today. We thank you for this opportunity.